Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Woods, the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at Marist and a graduate from the class of 1997. We're very excited to present this webinar to you today featuring Marist College Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer Michael Caputo. Mike joined Marist in July 2019 as VP for Information Technology and CIO. Previously, he was the Chief Information Officer of the Medical University of South Carolina with responsibilities for both the university and health system. Prior to moving to Charleston, he served as the CIO of the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. In addition, he served as the Director of Information Systems and the Director of Telemedicine Operations at the University of Vermont College of Medicine project executive of the C. Everett Coop Institute, a board member and treasurer of the American Telemedicine Association, and as a project scientist at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Mike's work has earned him numerous awards, including NASA Certificates of Recognition, a Leadership Award from the NASA Administrator, and two Uni United States patents. He received degrees from the Rochester Institute of Technology and the University of Houston. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. Oh, thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here. So I, uh, I've got a couple of slides that uh, I would like to share. I think it's a good good uh, to set this up. Uh, what I'm going to talk about: uh, cybersecurity tips during a pandemic. Um, I think they're especially important during a pandemic because we've seen a lot of uh, cyber criminal activity uh, aimed at uh, Marist users, students, faculty, staff, and, and even some of our alum. Uh, but these are good uh, technology practices, uh, even not in a pandemic. So what I'd like to cover at a high level uh, is email phishing, which is a huge problem right now. Uh, malware in general, a very particular type of malware called ransomware. I talk a little bit about fake websites and advertisements because someone uh, asked that question prior to uh, uh, the session, and then um, give you a couple of best practices and even a website that uh, that I often use just to make sure that my information hasn't been uh, compromised somewhere. So, phishing is uh, a huge issue um, all over the place. Uh, we deal with this almost every day, and I've got some examples, very current examples of Marist's. Uh, uh, phishing emails that we've received, um, but these are coming to people's personal accounts, their business accounts, uh, and these are uh, malicious attempts to get you to click on something or to give up your information, maybe your username and your password, um, as you'll see in some examples, also your banking information. Uh, and what I can tell you, and, and you know, I do follow the news on these things, um, they expect that this year the phishing attempts are going to be much more believable. They're, they're going to be much better. They're going to, and again, I have a couple of examples of recent ones where you can see that they're upping their game. And it's getting harder and harder to determine whether it's a real email or potentially a fake one, particularly since we're now all working at home. Uh, you know, we're looking at stuff on our phones, going through, you know, my, my, the volume of email that I receive per day has doubled. I'm getting hundreds of messages a day now, most of them work related. Um, but it makes it easy for a message like this to just sneak its way uh, under the radar and, and into your inbox and as you're going through to, to click on it and to have something happen. So what I'd like to show you is uh, Chris Del Giorno has agreed to let me use this example. He did not send this email, even though it appears that he did. You can see what I've highlighted here. It's from Chris Del Giorno, 88. But if you look at the actual email address, it's it's someone's Gmail account. It's not a real Marist account. This is not the real Chris Del Giorno. This was sent to some of his staff, as you may recall, on a Saturday morning with the message that says, I have an assignment I need you to do for me. I'm in a meeting. I won't be able to pick up calls. So the, this, uh, this cyber criminal has already figured out who works at Marist, who works for Chris. Chris is, uh, you know, he's a boss, so people might respond to this pretty quickly. And it did turn out that if you responded to this message, as, as someone did, they had a, a follow-up. And that was, I need you to run an errand for me. I need you to go buy me some eBay gift cards. And can you do that? And so as soon as the person saw this, they're like, wait a minute, Chris would never ask. They looked at the, at the, at the sender's address. They forwarded it to us um, as, as part of our regular process of dealing with these types of messages. But as you can see, 
what they've done is they they did their homework, and we'll talk about kind of how they how they do some of this. But uh, information from the website, information from social media, uh, information from LinkedIn. Um, they do their homework and they figure out what the relationships are between people in a particular organization. Uh, and it's not uncommon for them to send out these uh, these fake phishing messages, potentially even to be from from the president of a college or university. And sometimes they're a little more sophisticated and you can't tell that it's coming from a Gmail account. They actually craft it in such a way that it looks like it's coming from either your Marist account or your organization's account, even though it's coming from outside. So again, they're getting, they're getting very good at this. This one is, uh, this is an oldie but a goodie. It works just enough that they continue to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately no one fell for this. They, they realized that this was a, a fake message, but I have worked in organizations previously and, and just in a conversation with some of my peers last week, people are still responding to these uh, and, and giving up information or giving up in this case, gift cards. So, so, Mike, what would happen then if one of us responded to this? What would what's the next step of what they do? So the next step is that they want you to run out and buy gift cards, gift cards. and and then what they'll want you to do is to send you to scratch off and send you the send them send Chris Chris the codes on the back, and then they'll use that to purchase uh, goods. So they're they're basically doing this to steal money from you. Um, and again, this is not going to be a massive amount of money you know it would be you know a few hundred dollars but still that's a no, that's a terrible thing to happen to you there are other examples like this where they will ask you to process an invoice for a fake company and i have uh, known colleges that have suffered hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of loss from processing these fake invoices that came through in messages very very similar to this one um, and then of course there are other examples where they will send you a document or a link, and when you click on that, it actually downloads malicious software onto your computer and potentially into our network, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in ransomware. But it all starts with these phishing emails, and that's why this is the, as far as I'm concerned, if people can, can learn what to look for and to be suspicious of messages like this, um, it's, it will stop a tremendous amount of the actual cyber uh, security incidents that we deal with at Mariston and all organizations. So here is another recent phishing attack at Marist. Now this one's a little different. And as I said, they've started to up their game. So this is going out to students saying, hey, we are trying to uh, send you some a refund and there's a problem. Now, if you look at the top of this, you can see that they've used the official logos of Bank of America and Maris. So it gives it some legitimacy. It looks like it's real. And I have talked to uh, you know, a good number of students and uh, even some parents uh, who have seen this and wanted to know how did they do this? Well, they did this by going out to the website and just clipping those logos. It's, it's, it's easy to do, but this was done very well. So if you look at what I've circled in red, they're creating a sense of urgency. So if you don't do this immediately, you might lose your money. Well, okay, well, I better, I better act quickly. And what do they want you to do? They're, they're asking you to link or to, to press this link, which will take you to a page that will look like a Maris page or a Bank of America page. And they may ask you for your username and password, but what, they, what they're really after in this particular case is they're also after your banking info. So they're gonna want you to enter your bank account and your routing number. And once they have that, they can actually go and uh, access your account and steal money from you. Uh, so that's what this is. Uh, so we sent out a, a cyber alert to all of our students uh, uh, when this started hitting our campus, and and they changed the message just enough. It came out again two days later, so we sent another alert. Um, another clue on this particular one is, look at the you know they're saying that this is a financial aid refund, but financial aid isn't part of HR payroll. But that's that's who supposedly signed this one. So again, there there uh, there are some cues here that you can look for. Um, this doesn't make sense. I had a, a probably 20 or, or 30 students reach out to me directly saying, this looks suspicious or this is a scam, isn't it? So they're, they're becoming more and more aware of it. But um, unfortunately, uh, this works. It only has to work one or two times and, and they've been successful and these criminals will continue uh, to do this. Now, another thing that could have happened with this online verification button um, another variation of that, that that's very probable is when you click on that, 
it's not going to take you somewhere asking for your username and password. It's actually going to download a payload onto your computer, into the email system, or into our network that then is going to do other malicious activity that leads to other types of uh, cybersecurity problems. But this particular one is an attempt to steal people's money. Uh, and it is, it is a very active one. Uh, and again, in, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're in contact with you know, law enforcement about these things. There is a, they're seeing a huge spike in this type of activity right now, particularly with it being the end of the year, students uh, having been working online. Um, so all colleges and universities are facing this right now, as are other uh, uh, business enterprises across the country. So let's talk a little bit about malware. It's, uh, that's a general term. There are lots of computer malware. So there are the, a lot of people know about computer viruses and you know, those can uh, destroy information, lock up your computer. Um, that's, that stuff is still out there, but um, those days are, have now transitioned into how do we make, and rather than just being um, a, uh, someone who's, who's very smart and creates a computer virus that goes out and causes problems, now they're figuring out how do we monetize this. And so they've, they've gotten very good. So there's spyware, which can be downloaded and runs in the background, and it will monitor what websites you go to. It will record the keystroke, so it'll, it'll figure out your username and your password for your bank account and for other, uh, other accounts that you have. Uh, there are Trojans, just like the Trojan horse. Those get loaded in, and, and they become a backdoor for the criminals to get into your computer or into your account or into your system where they can then do other things, uh, steal information, or uh, the one that's in red right there, which is becoming the number one uh, cybersecurity problem, is ransomware. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But ransomware comes in generally through a phishing attack uh, and or a Trojan that you downloaded from a phishing email. So the malware process, and this is in, in, in the cybersecurity world also known as the kill chain, uh, has a number of defined steps. So first, and we talked a little bit about this before, it's, it's the reconnaissance. They gather information about you, uh, your company, your school, the team that you work for. So again, in that uh, phishing example, they knew who Chris was and they knew who worked for Chris. Uh, and they were able to get our, our information uh, pretty readily from the website and, and uh, business social media tools. Then they have some sort of a software, and it's called Weaponize, but it's it's a software that's going to be one of those things. It's going to be a Trojan. Uh, it's, it's going to be a, 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 a fake website that will harvest your credentials, your username and password, uh, potentially your banking information. Uh, the typical delivery method for all of these is through email because everybody's got it and everybody uh, clicks on it. And the, the better that they fake that email with logos and, and uh, you know, the right names or the right uh, departments on it as being being sent from, uh, the better their chances of people opening it. So that that is the one place where everyone can um, can be vigilant and and be protective, as well as of course keeping your uh, antivirus uh, and software up to date. Uh, then once they've they've got it in your system, then they're they're coming in looking for a particular vulnerability uh, either on your computer or in your network. Um, they may install software. Uh, and once they do that, they go into what phase six, which is pretty far down the food chain here. They're getting close to doing something terrible. Uh, it's where now they are now they have some uh, some communication with inside your system that you don't want them to have, and potentially even control over various uh, pieces of uh, software or hardware. And then the seventh step is that they they activate what this is. And in the case of malware, uh, or I'm sorry, ransomware, they encrypt your data. Uh, and this has happened uh, uh, quite a bit over the last year, um, and I want to talk specifically about it. So this is the uh, uh, really one of the top threats that we're looking at in 2020 from a um, computer security perspective. And essentially, this is holding your data ransom. It could be the data on your computer. It could be the data on your entire network. Uh, I know of organizations that have had every computer and every server, every file encrypted. And then the bad guys ask for a ransom to be paid in Bitcoin. Uh, and if you if you pay it, they will give you the uh, the key to unencrypt your data. And if you don't pay it within a specified period of time, your your information is lost, and you have to rebuild your systems uh, from scratch. And that that's a that's a tough choice. Do you pay the ransom or do you rebuild? 
but once this hits you, uh, it, it can be it can be pretty terrible and devastating. So uh, according to Inside Higher Ed, um, there were two uh, uh, well-known cyber uh, ransomwares that hit at the beginning of this academic year. So they they hit just before students arrived on campus. Uh, and again, they encrypted everything. Can you imagine, uh, you know, not being able to use email, not being able to use your, your iLearn system, uh, not being able to access your files and your folders, not being uh, able to uh, process, uh, you know, badge swipes for getting your meals. Uh, they can really shut down your electronic operations. And uh, so these hit, I think the timing was, uh, again, it was well-timed. It was just as students were coming back on campus, which is a very active time for emails going back and forth between people. These did come in as phishing emails to start. And then once they got their, their payload in, they were able to get across the network and, um, and a synchronized encryption activity happened. Um, and so there are, uh, um, there's more and more evidence that this is becoming um, uh, much more prevalent in all areas. So I know people who have been hit with this personally at their homes, uh, as well as other CIOs uh, who have had this hit their entire institution. So this is a very nasty one. Uh, again, it's going to come most likely through an email, uh, and it's going to require you to uh, to click on something, and it will download. And again, it's it's hoping that you are not uh, up to date with your antivirus, um, and uh, or potentially that your antivirus is not up to date and and working against this particular uh, piece of malware. I'm going to pivot to uh, fake websites and ads, uh, particularly during this, uh, this pandemic crisis that we've had. Um, there, are, uh, there are examples on, on all sorts of websites. I just happen to um, have personal experience with, uh, with issues uh, that have happened on Amazon and or Craigslist, so I'll give you two examples. So who knew toilet paper was going to be, you know, the thing that we were all trying to seek? And, um, and, and Personally, we fell for this one at home as well. We, you know, not, can't get it to stores uh, initially. So where did we go? We're, we're big Amazon Prime shoppers. So uh, we went ahead and we ordered, uh, you know, uh, a couple of boxes of, of toilet paper and then they never arrived. And um, what, you, what most people don't realize is that Amazon is a huge corporation, but Amazon is also a huge storefront for many small small businesses. So people can create websites or, or uh, storefronts within Amazon and have goods and services on there. So that my advice to you uh, is to uh, look at the average customer uh, ratings, um, read the reviews. Uh, it became very clear uh, when ours didn't arrive on time and we started to look at the reviews. It had just been updated by many people saying, hey, this is a scam. Uh, my product didn't deliver, the person is not being responsive, and I'm going to Amazon to, to try and get some sort of a refund. So again, it's, it's be a smart shopper, do your homework, uh, do a little bit of research, and it's the same thing, whether, whether it's on Amazon or Craigslist or eBay, you know, do what you can to research that person that, uh, that is going to be selling you something, because at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's just as easy for them to, to fake a product on, on Amazon or Craigslist. So another uh, one, and this one was uh, a few years ago that it happened to me. I was I was uh, moving and I was looking for temporary housing, and we uh, found a house in in the area that we were we were looking for that was uh, looked like a great deal on Craigslist uh, for rent, and uh, so I contacted the seller and said, Hey, I'm very interested. Uh, you know, can I get a look at the house? You know, what 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 do we have to do to rent this? And the person responded by email very quickly and said, oh, sorry, you can't go look at the house because there's currently somebody there. The, the renter hasn't left yet. And so it's available next week, uh, which made sense. That was logical. But the next part didn't. Uh, they needed me to send them a money gram immediately because there was a lot of, act, a lot of people interested in this house. And if I sent the money gram today, uh, then they would hold the house for me and I could move in. So that uh, set off one of my red flags. Um, because they weren't saying, hey, let me send you a copy of the contract, let me, you know, uh, let's, uh, let's check it out, um, or let's meet. So, um, 
it turns out that I was in the area. So uh, I drove by the house again. I noticed a for sale sign in front of it. So I called the realtor and the realtor said, oh, no, don't respond to this person. This is a scam. He has uh, this person will uh, ask you to send the money and then you'll never hear from them again. And unfortunately, this had worked well. And it, um, they had actually done that to some of the students at the institution that I was working at. Uh, and they showed up with their U-Haul ready to move into this house that they had not rented. Um, so they lost their money, they lost their current living arrangements, uh, and it was just a terrible, upsetting mess for these folks. So again, um, make sure that you do your homework, and, and if, it's, if it sounds like it's a really good deal, I, I do extra due diligence in checking it out. Um, but the, you know, I would say the same for you know, if you're buying a car or anything else uh, on any of these sites. I'm not picking on Craigslist. Um, you really have to uh, do some homework and understand who that person is on the other end because it's very easy for these cyber criminals to just set these systems up. And the, in the particular uh, scam that I started to fall for, they went and took the information off of the realtor's website and just created a Craigslist posting. So I talked to the realtor a couple of times. He said, every time we see it, we contact Craigslist and they'll take it down. And two days later, it shows back up. Um, and it's generating a lot of interest because uh, they, they were getting, uh, but if somebody's saying send a money gram, that should be a red flag that something's not right here. All right, so how do you know if your account has been hacked, if your information has been breached uh, somewhere else? So there is actually a website uh, and it is, uh, I've got the, it's up there at the top. It's uh, have I been, it's now that it's pwned.com. So this, this word comes out of the hacker lingo. Um, there, I'm not sure what the pronunciation is. I've heard it as just as have I been owned, have I been pwned, or have I been pawned? It doesn't matter how you pronounce it, it's all the same thing. It means has somebody got access to your account and you don't know about it. So I actually went into this website uh, not too long ago, entered in one of my other email addresses, not my Marist address. Uh, that's why I have it blacked out. And you'll see the message down here on the bottom. Oh, no, I've been pwned. So it says that there's one breached site that had my information that uh, is, is known to have been breached. So this is not a breach of Marist or any other place. This was a breach of Ticketfly, which was a, a concert ticket uh, um, system. I did have an account with them. And in May of 2018, uh, their website was hacked. Uh, they were actually uh, ransomware. They didn't pay the ransom, and 26 million unique email addresses uh, were posted online. So, uh, and it tells you right here that email addresses, names, phone numbers, and physical addresses. So they didn't actually get my user. Uh, they got my username or my email, but they didn't get my password. In other instances, they may get your username and your password. And so it's very good to check. A site like this, because this may give you a heads up that your your information has been compromised. But the other thing, this this gets again to a bad practice. Um, a lot of times, we use the same username and password for multiple accounts. And so, if it gets compromised one place, believe me, they know that we're creatures of habit, and they will try it. So, if they get it from a place like Ticketfly, they'll try and see, oh, does that work at Amazon? Does that work at uh, at your bank? Does this work at all these different places? And um, and they will uh, they will work that information. So the best advice I have is don't use the same uh, password for all of your accounts. Um, it's also very common because a lot of our accounts, uh, like Ticketfly, um, it it's your email address. Uh, so don't use the password for your email address when you use your email address as your username because that's a dead giveaway they can then get into your into your email uh, and if you look at the stat down here you know they've got 9.6 billion accounts uh, that have been compromised that this particular site will let you know if you're included in those uh, so actually I would ask or, or you know invite any of you to go ahead and and uh, see if you've been pwned uh, and if you have change your change your username or change your password uh, and again that's another good process is to change your passwords periodically and make sure that they're complex. Um, so yes, the, the funky characters, numbers and letters, uh, there are lots of uh, best practices that are out there and some of them are, you know, are all different. Some of them will be, 
use the first letter of each word in a in a phrase or a sentence or a you know a, a, a line of poetry or a song that you like. Those are all good practices. Um, you need to figure out what's going to work for you. But again, um, try and vary your your passwords um, so that you're not always using the same one. And there are some tools uh, that are built into the computers now where you can get some of these password keepers. Uh, that will help you. I don't recommend anyone in particular. Uh, there are lots of them out there, uh, but again, do your homework on these things. And speaking of passwords, here were the 20 most hacked passwords last year. And this was out of uh, 17 uh, million uh, breaches. These were the most common passwords that people used. I, I find it hard to believe that somebody would use the password one, two, three, four, five, six. But they do. Um, the fourth one on their password is the default password for a lot of uh, systems when you get them. And that means somebody just never changed the password. So th this list is actually is probably closer to a thousand well known ones, but these, these were the top 20. Um, and again, none of these are really following best practice. These are things that uh, you know, most people would think of if they were trying a password. Um, I like you know, the last two, monkey and dragon. Um, those might be okay as starters, but it needs to be a much longer phrase with numbers and uh, and random characters in it. Um, but if you're using, if any of these passwords look familiar to you, please go and change your password immediately uh, after we get off uh, from this uh, webinar. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen because those are uh, all of the people. I want I to know why, where monkey and dragon come from. Why those two? I don't know. Uh, you know, and, and something that I will say, even if it's not on here, children's names, birth dates, anniversaries, <laughs> pets' names, not a good idea. Um, again, these people, if they're targeting you or sometimes they're just sweeping through social media like Facebook, uh, when they see those things, they'll they'll then uh, they'll they'll capture that and then they'll go try it. And yeah. a lot of people tell me that they use those and isn't that safe? And I'm like, no, not not anymore. I agree. Yeah, we have to remember social media. What's out there? We had a uh, question come in before the webinar uh, that was, what are the best practices or products to use to back up your data? Uh, so I think that's an important topic, and I, I didn't touch on it this time, but backing up your, your data is really important. Um, you, you just don't know when something's going to happen to your computer. Uh, it, it could be an electrical issue in your house. Uh, it could be computers old enough, it just dies, or it could be something more malicious that we've talked about, like encryption. Uh, so I, I don't recommend any particular product, but I do recommend that you back it up. Uh, and then you get to the, should I back it up to the cloud, or should I back it up physically? And again, those those are personal choices. The, some of the cloud products are free. I, I think anybody with an iPhone is probably saving their images, you know, up there for free, or you know, paying, uh, you know, the whatever it is, small amount per month to for for a lot of room. Um, what I don't recommend, and I'm looking to see if I have one laying on my desk, is is don't save onto just a USB drive, a little USB drive like these. These are fairly cheaply made and have a tendency to break. So if you are going to back up onto this, I would say that you back up onto it a couple of times. Uh, get, you know, back it up twice so that you have it. Um, not that I was planning on this, but I do have my own personal backup. And because I'm a little bit, you know, cyber paranoid, I, I use this, which is encrypted. So it is a, uh, it's a USB drive plugs into my computer and then requires me to, to punch in a code decrypt the drive, I'll, re I'll save everything on here so that if this ever disappears, if someone were to take this, they can't get into it without my passcode on this as well. So that's, that's one thing that I might recommend. I've heard of tools that, because you suggest having a different password for almost every single site that you belong to, there are tools out there, correct, that can save all your passwords for you. Those make me a little nervous. Is that something you recommend or not? Well, again, I think it's um, it's better than writing them down on a piece of paper, uh, which is so. If I had a had a dollar for every time I found someone's password when I went to go meet with them and help them, and it was written somewhere on their desk, uh, you know, you're laughing because you know I don't want if I come to your office, I will be looking for your password now, or it's on a yellow sticky. So writing it down, that's that's somebody you know anybody who comes in and has access to your desk will will get it. 
Um, I, I do know some people who keep all their passwords in a little notebook and they keep the notebook in a locked drawer and that's probably okay. These other password manager tools, um, I use one on my iPhone. Uh, there are some that will actually, if, if you're using your phone or if it's on your computer and you go to the website, it will actually keep it for you. Uh, I know that Apple has their, uh, their keychain. So I think that these are better than, much better than using the same password, uh, one that you can remember. Um, should you be a little nervous? Well, you know, you, you saw on that, uh, on that uh, one of the prior slides that uh, a lot of these vendors get hacked. Um, so if that happens, would they have access to all of your passwords? Maybe, um, but I, you know, again, if you're using one of the more reputable ones, and again, do your homework. Uh, there's new products coming out all the time, and there's plenty of places that will go out and uh, they'll evaluate these and kind of give you a rating. Um, I use uh, CNET, other people use Macworld or PC World. Um, I think those are all great resources to then look at what the top ones are. And while we're on that topic, I think another best practice is making sure that you have, uh, you know, um, protection on your computer. A lot of the new ones, it comes built in, but it's the free one. And so it's okay. Um, it's better than none for sure. Um, and again, if you if you are uh, wanting to make sure that you're safer, there are uh, paid versions uh, that are out there uh, that are also good. But again, those change year after year, and, and sometimes uh, some of those fall out of favor. But um, and I, I do recall there was a, a question sent in advance uh, about how often should I back up my information. Um, and you should back it up regularly, whatever that means. Uh, if you're backing it up once a week or every two weeks or every month, you're probably, you know, in the top 99% of the most backed up people. Uh, at places like Marist, we back up our data on a regular basis every, every day on our systems. But as an independent user at home, I would say, um, you know, if you're very active, then you should be doing it a couple times a month. It's good to get into the, it's like taking out the trash. Nobody likes to do it, but it's a process that, you know, once you once you build it into your schedule and you do it, it, it seems to get done okay. Uh, but I would definitely say you should be doing it at least once a month uh, would be my recommendation. And remember, there's a lot of things that could happen. If something happened to your home, if it was flooded or if it, or, you know, if it caught on fire, are you keeping, you know, your backup right next to your computer? Or should you be keeping this in a different, you know, in a closet somewhere else uh, where it's something that you can grab? Uh, and having moved here from South Carolina, I can tell you we had to evacuate for hurricanes. Uh, so it was very often I, I kept all my backups in a drawer along with, you know, important papers. And we would just grab that, throw it into a suitcase, and, and we would go. So, um, you know, the, the best practices are, are the things that are kind of common sense. Let's back it up. Keep it safe use a good password, don't always use the same password. And again, if there's anything that I can impress upon people right now, it's be very, very suspicious of the emails uh, uh, that come in. Make sure that it's, uh, that it, you know, that it is who you think it is, who you believe it is. And it's, uh, and one thing that's a common mistake is, oh, well, you know, I just got this message from Chris Delgiorno. Let me go ahead and, and email back and make sure that's really Chris. Uh, you should call the person or reach them through a through a separate channel other than the one that's coming to you that's suspicious. And but it's it's okay if you've opened the email, correct? Just opening it doesn't do anything. Just opening it shouldn't do anything. Okay. Um, and and of course you don't know it's it's Chris until you you know uh, what the message is, and you may not be suspicious. But once you do, you've got to be very very careful because. Uh, um in in that particular one from chris that was they were looking for uh for a dialogue and so they they already had their preset script ready for when you respond i'm going to tell you that i need you to go out and get me some some uh you know gift cards um but a lot of times it will be an attachment uh and opening that attachment just opening the attachment is enough to download uh malicious software onto your computer all right, I think we tackled all the questions. Is there anything else that we might have missed? I think we, I think you and I had figured out everything that our alums and our guests wanted to know. But thank you very much for taking the time to go through this with us. And folks that are watching this um, through our YouTube channel can click back to the Marist Alumni site if you'd like to see a collection of all the web presentations we've done over the past few weeks. And if you have any other questions for 
Mike, feel free to send them to the alumni office and we'll get them to Mike so he can answer them for you. Uh, but thanks so much for your time today, Mike. Have a great rest of your day. Oh, thanks. It's been my pleasure.